Okay, I think we'll go ahead and start. I'm, I know we're going to be having still more people um, joining as we go along, but I want to respect everybody's time. Um, and given the difference in time zones and so on, uh, it's, it's very late for some people, very early for some others. So um, my name is Tom Fleischner. I will be sort of the MC here tonight of sorts, and um, I'm the executive director of the Natural History Institute based here in Prescott, Arizona. And um, so I wanted to uh, just welcome you on behalf of the Institute and tell you a little bit about how this is going to work tonight. Um, um, uh, the Natural History Institute is a is a 501c3 nonprofit organization here in Presque, here in North, based in Northern Arizona, but with a much broader um, sort of constituency and activities. Um, the mission, our mission of the institute, is to provide leadership and resources for a revitalized practice of natural history that integrates art, science, and humanities to promote the health and well-being of humans and the rest of the natural world. So that's our mission, and we go about that in many different ways. And one of the ways that we did that, and that everybody uh, here and many of the people in the uh, uh, attending uh, audience um, were involved was in a, a national, we called it a confluence, a, a, a conference uh, just, just under a year ago, last November, it was in Sedona, Arizona, uh, called Reciprocal Healing, Nature, Health, and Wild Vitality. And everybody uh, on the panel here was, was very much involved in, in making that happen, uh, as were a number of people that are in the, in the audience here. Um, and out of that, uh, that wonderful gathering, um, there was uh, Peter Kahn, the editor-in-chief of the journal Ecopsychology, uh, uh, invited us to create a special issue of that journal, Ecopsychology, which you'll be hearing more about in a bit, um, to, that would follow up on the theme. So we invited conference participants to submit, but also we put out the call more widely. And, and many of you, and I'll mention a few uh, names of people that I know are contributing authors who are on the, on the session here. Uh, in a moment. So that's kind of what led us, and, and, and that issue just came out um, less than a month ago, and so sort of to both celebrate and reflect on that and have a, a larger community conversation about some of the issues is what led to this roundtable discussion. Um, just a couple other things about the Natural History Institute. I just want to um, just welcome you to our, our far-flung community and invite you to check out our website, which is just naturalhistoryinstitute.org. We also have a YouTube channel, um, which actually this um, session will be archived on as of tomorrow, along with many other programs, and as well as many sessions and interviews associated from the Confluence last fall. Um, I also want to uh, uh, say thank you and, and uh, shout out to our two uh, co-sponsoring organizations, the, the Ecopsychology Journal and the Natura Institute for Ecology and Medicine, and you'll be hearing more about both of those organizations as well. Um, that said, happy October and happy full moon <laughs> on auspicious day um, here. And just um, a, a couple things. I, I've mentioned some of this to, to, uh, as people have been loading on, but I just want to mention again. So the, the, um, the chat function is fun for saying hello and whatnot, but, but um, many of our experience in mini Zoom uh, sessions is that it has can be very distracting if people are chatting and back and forth uh, off to the side while a, a conversation is happening on the screen. So what we are going to do is we're going to uh, disable the chat function now, uh, but another function will essentially take its place, which is the Q&A function, which uh, you'll find at the bottom of your screen. So as people are making commentary here, um, if you, if it's, if it, uh, stimulates a question or a comment, uh, for a, any one of the panelists, uh, or, um, if, uh, those of you who are, are very good students and have read all the articles in the journal already, a number of the authors are on and, and, uh, comment questions could be addressed to them as well. Um, and, um, and you, and you can start doing those questions and answers anytime now. We won't get to that till a little bit later, but, but that is a very important part of this is, is hearing from you all uh, in writing. You can still be in your pajamas and we won't see you. Um, so um, anyway, that said, um, I would, uh, it's my real pleasure to introduce uh, our distinguished panel here. Um, so 
Thank you for joining us here tonight, my friends. Um, so uh, Laura Sewell um, is the author of a seminal book in eco-psychology called Sight and Sensibility, the Eco-Psychology of Perception. Laura uh, has taught eco-psychology and environmental perception for many years, uh, first at Prescott College and, and for many years at Bates College and also was the uh, until recently was the director of the Bates Morse Mountain Conservation Area on the coast of Maine, where and she is calling in from Maine. So welcome, Laura. Um, um, uh, Anna O'Malley, um, welcome, Anna. Um, Anna is a, uh, an integrative family and community uh, medicine physician based in West Marin County, California. And she is also the founding director of the Natura Institute for Ecology and Medicine, which is based in the Commonweal Garden there in Marin. So um, welcome, Anna. Um, and um, uh, last but not least, Peter Kahn Jr. Um, is the editor in chief of the journal Ecopsychology, as I already mentioned. He's also the co-editor of, of uh, two really important books in Ecopsychology. Um, uh, one called Ecopsychology Science, Totems and the Technological Species, and also the Rediscovery of the Wild. And Peter is a professor at the University of Washington in Seattle, uh, and he has uh, sort of dual appointments in both uh, the Department of Psychology and also the School of Environmental and Forest Sciences. So thank you so much, all of you, for, for making the time to join us here tonight. I, and I also wanted to uh, have a shout out um, to, uh, as I say, this is, is sort of celebrating and reflecting on this special issue of the journal. And I know, or at least from the preliminary sign-up uh, list, I haven't been able to be monitoring who's actually checking in here, but um, a number of the authors, or at least uh, authors and co-authors of some of the different um, articles, uh, I believe are with us. And so I just wanted to mention um, Harry Green, Edie Dillon, Usha Varanasi, Sarah Werber, Jason Kaufman, uh, Rachel Yerberry, and Laura Orlando, I believe, are on the call. So if any of you have been having burning questions about anything from those articles, um, uh, we, uh, uh, there will be an opportunity later. And Anna also was a, a contributing author. And Laura and I uh, were the, the co-guest editors of the issue, working closely with Peter um, on that. And, and last but not least, I wanted to also give a shout out to, to the, the invisible person uh, named tech support, <laughs> Zora Elunga Reed, who is our, uh, uh, our wonderful um, tech person who is actually helping us coordinate this behind the scenes. And she is currently in New York City. So um, I'm gonna, um, as I say, I'm gonna sort of uh, ask each of the panelists um, a question or two, and um, then um, we'll sort of have some open discussion between us here on this panel, and then we'll be opening it up to your questions as they start arriving through the Q&A, and I see there already is a couple of questions. So um, uh, maybe I'll start with you, Laura. Um, the, the issue, um, both the confluence last year and this, therefore, this special issue that came out of that, we was about reciprocal healing. And, and so this, uh, I was wondering if you could reflect for us a little bit on, on this notion of reciprocity. What do we really mean by that? Why does that matter so much? And, and, and why, from your perspective, is that idea of reciprocity so important um, for both the confluence and the special issue? So, Laura. Hmm. Well, um, of course, there's a lot we could say about reciprocity, but I think it's important to make it so simple because we need to start doing it <laughs> right now. So I want to say that when I think about reciprocity in the context of humans and nature, I'm simply thinking about giving back. I have always seen um, nature and the earth as being a um, uh, place of great gifts. And so I, I, there's a, a part of me that has always thought the most important thing is to simply give back just as we would with friends. 
So when you look at the root of the word reciprocity, it's, it's a Latin word reciprocus, and it means moving back and forth or giving and receiving. So it's, it's really mutuality. And when I think about why it's important, it's because we've been taking so profoundly from the planet for so long. And because we have, um, this modern worldview that is so oriented towards nature as a resource that we don't think about it in terms, or we don't readily think in terms of giving back as we would to a friend. Um, so it's because the reason why it's so important is because the earth really needs our care and attention. It needs to be restored. It needs its wholeness. And in the context of us being, in the context of an era in which humans are the dominant force on the planet, the Anthropocene, this continued uh, taking and depletion will run us to ruin. So that's the very first reason why I think it's important. And I think it's really very simple. The, the second reason that came to mind right away actually was inspired by um, some combination of my feelings about wanting to give back to the trees and the waters and the birds. Um, and what Robin Wall Kimmerer has said so eloquently. Um, and in essence, it's that reciprocity feels good. So the way Robin put it is that when we receive a gift, as the earth is giving to us every day. When we receive a gift, we feel gratitude and we want to give back, we want to be generous, we want to be part of, we want to engage. But without gratitude, our spirits can go hungry. So this is something that's fascinated me a lot in terms of are overconsumption. David Loy refers to this as a lack in the Western psyche that has been driving our overconsumption for generations. It's the hungry ghost that fills itself with things, with stuff that is trying to feed that hunger for connection with stuff. To give back <laughs> is the remedy. To give back is what feels good and satisfies that very deep longing for connection. And if we could do that, it would break that cycle of consuming because we're not satiated. So um, those are two really quick uh, reasons for why I think it's so important. One is just the, the rawness of the depletion and degradation on the planet. Um, and the other is more about our spirits and our psyches and the fact that we are um, needing to change our behavior. It's no longer about adapting the world to our needs. It's about us adapting to meet the world and the earth's needs. So that's what I'd say to introduce the notion of reciprocity. That's great, thank you. It, it's um, it's kind of interesting and sort of paradoxical in a way, following up on, on the point you, you um, mentioned from Robin, that in a way, it, reciprocity is good for us. <laughs> that, that it's almost like a, like a, a, um, uh, a self, uh, a self-centered reason for like being being unselfish is good for us selfishly. So it's, it's kind yes, of and, and and that of course is the Buddhist notion of enlightened self-interest. Right. We realize how interdependent we are, and we realize how um, all flourishing is mutual. When we realize that, there's really no separation with these uh, exchanges either. I mean. To give is a really different mindset than resourcism or taking because it's supposedly our right. And um, yeah, 
giving is good yeah. for us and all. Great, great. Yeah. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, I well, I wanted to reiterate one thing because I we do have people still kind of continually joining, and just mention again that um, the chat function is currently turned off. But if you do, if any of the speakers' comments um, stimulate a question or a comment, um, feel free to put that uh, to to put that up on screen on the the Q and A function, which you'll find at the bottom uh, of the screen. Yeah. Tom, if I could just jump in on, um, I think somebody on the chat uh, had mentioned that the, somebody's mic must be on and there's a background noise and that's kind of cutting through and I don't, not sure where that's coming from. Um, so yeah, I know that too. I don't know if other people are hearing it or it, it's not happening at this exact moment, <laughs> but it's been happening through the discussion. So uh, um, is it just our mics that are on or other people's mics Yeah, it's on? just our mics that are on. Mm. I haven't heard it, but yeah, so if each of us can make sure we mute ourselves when we're not speaking, thank you for mentioning that. Can, can I add one more thing as a way to, um, I think you're, to segue to Anna about, Tom, you there? Yeah. About the conference. Um, yeah. So this notion of reciprocity also came up when uh, we started talking about a conference on how natural experience or the natural world heals us. And because there's become, there's come to be so much evidence and literature on that topic. And it feels so critically important for people to understand that. But it seemed to me that we couldn't go into this notion of healing and introduce it without building right into it from as early as we could the notion that it's got to be a two way street. So, it, you know, that that we couldn't heal ourselves from nature if nature itself is degraded. Great. Thank you. And I see Jason. Thank you. Uh, with a with a hypothesis that it that I'm the problem, <laughs> uh, that my mic might be rubbing against my collar. So when I'm speaking, I'll try to hold it out in a way. We'll see if that helps. Um, okay, so I want to I want to turn to Anna now, um, who in a way I've I've, I've given a, a particularly daunting um, task to um, Anna, as I mentioned before, is a is a practicing um, community physician, and um, and in this uh, issue, Anna wrote an article, um, the title is uh, Nature as Ally in Our Chronic Disease Epidemic. And of course, it was quite interesting because this article was largely written before COVID started taking over everything. And so but that got addressed in it as well. So um, so Anna, you're, you're, you did a wonderful job in this article of, of sort of synthesizing a huge amount of, of sort of technical literature and medical science um, and some from psychology as well. And so um, the, if you could sort of try to highlight for us just maybe a few sort of, you might say, bullet points out of that of, of what, do you, what do you think are, for, for those of us who are not reading medical literature, um, what, what are some of the key points that you think are emerging? Because it seems as though there's a lot of it, it's coming out fast and furious. And it's, it's um, you know, the, the idea is that nature is healing is not a fringe idea by, at all, by any means anymore. So could you, from a doctor's perspective, kind of share with us a little bit of what, what we're learning? Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you. And I, I just want to start again with gratitude for the opportunity to be here and to even be in this conversation um, at this planetary moment. So I just wanna briefly contextualize my remarks as a, a primary care physician that works within a community health center. And I, I am an integrative medicine provider and I care a lot about um, the community well-being, our, the well-being in the collective, as well as the well-being of our planet. Um, and they are inextricably linked as we are all um, increasingly become aware if that's not something that we were aware of now. I'm in Northern California. Um, our well-being out here is directly impact right now by what we have brought on this planet. Um, so we're, we are all in this together, all humans and, and more than or non-humans, however we wanna say it, we're all in this together. 
So I could start by, by just saying, simply put, wherever you look in the medical, medical literature, be it on cardiovascular disease or high blood pressure or immune function or how well we sleep or risk of cancer or stress-related illnesses, and there are so many, that nature uh, is, has been found to be good for us. And it makes sense when we think about in this Anthropocene era and what we know about anthropogenic or human uh, driven factors, societal factors that make us unwell, meaning that you know we're no secret living in a, a stressful time marked by overconsumption and various forces that that uh, really aren't that we humans aren't evolved to withstand, and a separation and estrangement from the uh, that which allows us to feel whole and. Um, integrated within our, our natural ecosystems, that which we are evolved to be in, we're, we're relatively estranged and it's hard on our bodies and it creates inflammation and it creates, uh, you know, all of this stimulation of our sympathetic nervous system and that suppresses our immune system and drives inflammation. And what we are increasingly understanding in medicine is that inflammation is this final common pathway of a lot of chronic diseases. And before COVID, we were in the middle of a chronic disease epidemic in, in our country and in, in, in much of the uh, you know, Western world. We, we consume a lot and you know, just as we are driving the natural world to ruin, we are driving our bodies, a reflection of nature ourselves to ruin as well. And so, uh, so basically the med medical literature very clearly and solidly, definitively shows that being in nature is great for us. Um, and this makes sense. And I, I think that what is particularly inspiring for me as a, as a person who is, you know, charged with my, this sacred responsibility to take care of the health of my patients and the community, and I would extend that to, to you know, society, that uh, the, the more we are able to uh, support all of our human family with upstream interventions, uh, the better actually we're off in a planetary sense as well. We know that all of these downstream interventions that we're doing, like throwing pills at symptoms and doing procedures in the hospital and hospitalizing people at great expense and great suffering, that uh, that that is actually generating a huge carbon footprint as well. So when I think about um, the, the medical literature, which is really clear, and the psychological literature, which is beautiful in the fact that when we're out in nature, we don't have this desire to, uh, we don't have the same void that we might be seeking to consume, um, to fill. We don't have the same estrangement. We're also nicer, <laughs> you know, we're, we're kinder to each other. We're um, better connected with each other. And, um, and we also know that in this era of loneliness and estrangement, that also is uh, creating some of the inflammation and the, the chronic illness. So it really, um, there's, there's beautiful complexity in the literature around the way that medical, that uh, exposure to nature heals us, both from some of those biomarkers of inflammation and what it's doing for our immune system and the way we're breathing in substances that are supporting our immune system and, and dampening the risk of cancer to the way it, it draws us into deeper connection with ourselves and with each other. And the, the more we're able to, to access that, uh, not as a resource, but as, as a way that we're woven back into the, the web of life, the, uh, the less consuming, the less downstream interventions are required, the more we're, the more we're able to bring um, connection with nature at the, the center of our life and our society and our way of being, um, it will, automatically be a, an act of reciprocity um, if, we're, if we're really attuning ourselves to that exchange and to be back in that whole relationship. And um, you know, it would transform our, our health collectively. Uh, and I made mention in the, in the article that I wrote that if we don't change course, that we, um, 
our our economy already beleaguered economy will be by 2030 in in a, a really dangerous place if we continue to go at our current pace of over consuming and being disconnected and distracted and just relying on pills and procedures which are petroleum based which is another thing for us to be paying attention to so um, so there's much in the literature that for us to pay attention to and the context couldn't be um, I mean there's just such a strong imperative for us to be doing something differently and and the way in which nature beautifully balances out all of these anthropogenic forces, be it stress, be it inflammation, be it disconnection. Um, it's it's a, an incredibly compelling medicine for us at this moment. Thank you so much, Anna. Uh, it's a great summary. And you know, when, and when I've dabbled a little bit in some of this literature, it what's really struck me is how it, I mean, th there's there's a certain sense in the past sometimes that that it was kind of like a woo woo idea, you know, that 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 nature would heal us or whatever. And but but in the as I got more and more into the medical literature and you, obviously much much deeper, is is just how how many like just basic empirical measurable phenomena that that are sort of standard medical um, uh, parameters of health are all that, that those connections are made even more than I realized before I was checking that. And so um, mm -hmm. that's, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm sure there'll be more questions for you and uh, we'll get, you know, online diagnoses for all of us. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, Peter, um, I wanted to, um, ask you so if first of all i realize not everybody who is um probably many people who are are with us here tonight um are very familiar with the journal ecopsychology but but some may not be so if if you could tell us a little bit about the journal uh and then um kind of how do you see does this particular special issue or this theme of reciprocal healing fitting into the kind of larger arc of eco-psychology, both as a field and as a journal. And, and before I turn it over to you, I, I might also mention that we put in the chat earlier, we put um, a link, P Peter and his colleagues at the journal were very kind and, and made access to the journal free for a month. It's usually you have to be a subscriber or go to a library or what have you. And we have about a week left of that time. And I put the link in the in the chat and we'll we'll make sure that that's up if anybody who wants to see it has not yet seen it um we really encourage you to do that so um peter mm, thank you tom thank thank you for thank you for organizing this <laughs> and uh laura and anna for the all the work you did for the sedona conference that this came out of and, and that the journal issue came out of uh the the eco psychology it's it's not so different from the way tom is now working that is working natural history of this deep relationship with not just humans but humans with the more than human world and um you know it's it's the plants and animals and mountains and oceans and ecosystems and watersheds and earth and life life itself and um, yeah, you know, we, we, we came of age, we, we came of age with, with this. I mean, so part of some piece of eco-psychology has a, a, an evolutionary basis that, that for tens and even hundreds of thousands of years, we came of age with nature and big nature and wild nature. And that need is so deep within the architecture of our minds and brains and, and, and our bodies, of course, and, 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 the, human, and the human spirit um that so that's a piece of eco psychology um so yeah there's an academic journal eco psychology journal <laughs> that makes it something right <laughs> and uh as tom mentioned it's just fabulous that uh the eco psychology uh i mean marianne liebert of, of who has many journals committed to this and she's just uh uh, futuristic in seeing what's important and, and she recognized this and one piece of eco psychology that she and many people are drawn to is this nature and health side of eco psychology. When I took up the editorship in, uh, in 2013, in my ed first editorial and I kind of went back to that and go, oh, I still agree with that, <laughs> which means I've, I haven't really come very far, unfortunately, <laughs> but I said that um, 
nature, nature, you know, the, the benefits of, 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 of interacting with nature for, for physical and psychological health, that that's often an, a starting point for people into eco-psychology. It's a beginning, it's an entry, but it's not an end. And the, the concern is, um, and, and Laura, you were, you were referring to this and, and we're kind of nailing the resources issue that if nature is a resource, um, then that's part of the domination worldview that we continue to enact in our lives. And, and when I look out onto the world, you know, uh, today, I, I think one of the main problems is of domination, of domination of people over other people and of people over nature. And then we just look at the debates and the president, I mean, I, I, you know, I just speak bluntly, I think the president of the United States, that was fundamentally deeply, just deeply a domination model of people over people and embedded in that is people over the earth. And there, there's, we can't solve that problem if we in some way try to sugarcoat any form of domination. And I think the concern of nature and, and health is if, if it becomes nature for health and Risha Varanasi is a part of this group of, I mean, in, um, we have a nature and health group as part of the University of Washington. I'm part of that, Usha is too. And Usha was really clear that it, the name nature for health needed to change back to nature and health because if it's for health, nature's a resource and that's part of the domination. But notice what's at stake and why Tom and, and Laura and Anna, what you're bringing forward is so important on reciprocity. Because if it's nature for health, yeah, we, you might, we might get an, uh, con some conservation. We may give back in certain ways, but we're giving back in order to get. And we're not so concerned about giving. We're just giving in order to get. What do we get? We get our health. We get physical health and reduced inflammation and all the things Anna's talking about. So that's some, just the incredible importance of what you've been talking about is with reciprocity is it's a reframing. It's asking us to pivot away from nature for and nature with, you know, with us, with nature and in reciprocal relationship. And I think so much of what's at stake then is, and that we need to flesh out more and maybe we can do some of that uh, today, which is what do we mean by reciprocity? And I think Laura started on that and that's a, that in some sense is the critical issue. And the deeper we can go on that, I think the more we move, we, we, give, we give ourselves the tools to move away from dominating over and being in relation with. So uh, there's lots more I would like to contribute, but um, that's a good place to, to stop. Thank you, Peter. Um, before we, um, again, um, I wanna invite people to uh, be uh, adding some questions and or comments to the, uh, um, to the, our Q and A uh, function here, because um, we'll be uh, getting, uh, have an opportunity to get to those questions and comments here very shortly. Um, I just wanted to ask everybody in the panel, actually, um, the uh, um, one of us once wrote, um, and uh, as we heal ourselves, we heal the world, and vice versa. And, and that those two sentences we have used as kind of some guiding uh, guiding um, language for both the confluence last year and we mentioned it in the special issue in the article that Laura and I wrote and um, um, the um, I just wanted to ask each of the three of you what does that mean to you is that is that really a valid statement is that um, is that just hyperbole uh, is that is there any particular ways you see that um, manifesting in intangible ways um, I'll, I'll start um, so I was thinking thinking a lot about the ecological self recently um, partly because my class and I were talking about what it means to be of earth or part of earth or earth speaking um, or um, the earth speaking through us. And when I think of that quote about as we heal ourselves, 
so does the earth heal or say it again, Tom, what exactly, how's it go? As we heal ourselves. All right, I was muted. Um, as we heal ourselves, we heal the world and vice versa. Yeah, yeah. So there's a way in which um, that is such a, a beautiful short sentence that there's um, what it comes up, what comes up in me is that there's no separation there between ourselves and the world. It's, it's just all part of the mix. And so if we are of the earth and we're healing ourselves, we're healing earth. We're healing ourselves as part of earth and we're healing the part of ourselves that can be healers for the rest of earth. Um, I just, it, it amplifies in me the no separation um, framework. So it's, it's um, it makes me think we are nature healing when we do our healing actions and efforts. Um, and so I think the difficulty with the definition that we're the definition of reciprocity becomes more complex or more difficult is with those actions as we do the healing. What does that look like? What does that really mean? And when you and I were editing um, these articles, uh, it seemed that, that there were, it was difficult for us, some of us, many of us, to articulate reciprocity, not as a concept or not as a, a hope, but as an action, something that we do, something that we can trust has implications, healing implications. Um, you know, what, is it, what does it mean in that context? So that's what that quote comes, brings up in me. That's great, thank you, Laura. And, and we're starting to get some great questions, which we'll get to in um, in just a, a couple minutes here. But um, uh, Anna or Peter, either of you have anything you'd like to add about that? Uh, I, I love I love what you said, Laura. And for me, um, you know, what what comes up for me is that that the surest way, perhaps, for the Earth to bring herself or her non-gendered um, binary self into into being in a, a restored healing way is for us to do our work and exercise some restraint and that um, the only way we can rein ourselves in and our self-destructive and uh, over-consuming depleting ways is for us to do our inner work and that until we, all of us, have deeply looked at our shadows and uh, be the, the, like, if it's the, the domination over paradigm of the earth or of our others in our human family, uh, the way we, we are turning away from the cries of, of so many right now and our cynical uh, desire to continue to make money or to get ahead or whatever whatever the story, until we, are able to deeply and honestly, self-reflectively look at our shadow and do our healing work, it's going to be very hard for the earth to do what she can quite readily do as soon as we stop destroying <laughs> aspects of her. Um, so I think what comes up for me is that um, the idea that the world needs us to heal it I think we need to stop hurting it and um, and to see our, our way into um, being, we are a reflection of nature, we are of nature. And it's true that as we heal ourselves, we are inherently working toward healing nature because we are nature. Um, and I, um, I think that the more we can be in a state of humility and grace and in awe of the way in which we can attune ourselves to the regenerative pulse of nature and align ourselves therewith in a deeply reverential, uh, humble way. 
while looking at our own stuff, that that is, that's where the recipro reciprocity is truly able to flow and the healing will happen. That's wonderful. Uh, yeah, that's really beautiful. <laughs> really great. Um, you know, we have the importance of, uh, you know, Laura's talking also to them about action and then Anna's taking it and talking about different types of action. And one of the action is that internal part and then the restraint part, but I also really love the humility part. Um, the, I think part of what we can do is, I mean, hmm. so far in our conversation, we've often been making analogies to human-human relationships. What, what is healthy human-human relationship, but then trying to carry that over into thinking about human nature. So if you think of what one does or in, in a human human, I mean, it's not all about me, right? And if you're in a relationship, it's not about me. And, and that's part of the use model. That would be, of course, again, I go back to the political situation today and all the many politicians or the one I've been mentioning, it's, it's about him. And that's the fundamental, it's a fundamental problem. Well, in rela any relationship, if it's about me, that's a problem. And so in our relationship with the earth, if it's about me, it's a, it's a problem. And then carrying that over, what one does in relationship is of establishing reciprocity in relationship with another human being is, is that one listens. <laughs> one listens without preconceived I mean, it's not all or nothing, but one tries to set aside that active mind that's judging and trying to grab hold and you listen and be receptive to the person. And I think that's connecting with what Anna's saying, because if, in, if we approach nature and one of the things we do in terms of healing, which is part of a recipro reciprocity, is that a starting point is, can we listen? You know. Uh, Maladomo Somme talks about this in one of uh, the interviews I heard of, of him. And he's so beautiful because he's saying, can we, he's, I think, maybe talking about, to, about trees or something. But if you're thinking about restoration and giving back to the earth, can you listen? Can you just first listen <laughs> before? And, and so part of what I worry about when we're saying, well, reciprocity, it's give and take. And so we're going to, we get from nature what we, you know, benefit from. And then part of our responsibility is to give back. And so then we become conservationists and now we engage in conservation. All of that's good. But I don't think it's quite framed right. And the concern, and I think Anna's just nailed it, is that it very close, quickly becomes a sort of Western hubris and we don't even recognize it. It's so deep within many of us, the notion that we, we can fix things. We're, Maladomo Samay says, we're the redeemer. <laughs> you know, we're not the redeemer, we're not gonna fix, right? I mean, we have responsibilities, yes, but to go in thinking that we're the fixer, that, that in itself, I think, is undermining, Tom, what, what, what you're trying to bring forward in terms of reciprocity. Thank you so much, all of you. Um, yeah, that's great too. I uh, maybe all I would add at the moment is is uh, is I wanted to clarify for some. I mean, the term natural history is is something that is uh, not necessarily understood the same by all. Um, so I just I, without going into a whole long uh, uh, talk about that. Um, it literally means the original term historia naturalis in um, Latin means the story of nature. And um, so my kind of my definition and what sort of the, the operating definition we use here at the Institute is that, that natural history is, a, is a, a practice of intentional focused attentiveness to the more than human world guided by honesty and accuracy. So that that's a broad, expansive definition, but it's it, you know you can boil that down to like sort of paying attention, which is sort of like what Peter's talking about in terms of the uh, as several of you are talking about in terms of the listening. So the attentiveness, uh, or I or I could would say the practice of natural history itself engenders humility, 
uh, because we, we, we bear witness to forces and, uh, that are so much bigger than ourselves and, that are, and beauties that are so much more beautiful than ourselves and horrors that are more horrible than ourselves. And it's, um, so that, that sort of gets us into that mode of being receptive um, to, to what the world is asking of us, I would say. And um, so uh, in the interest of time, I think I'll, I'd like to turn to some of the great questions that are coming in um, from the, the, the group here. Uh, and then at the end, I'd like to come back and just see if, if anybody on the panel has any other questions for one another. Um, so uh, um, the, um, and I think one, one of the questions, um, and by the way, when in this Q and A function, if there's, um, if there's a question that somebody else puts up and it's kind of like basically what you wanted to ask and you'd like to emphasize that, there's a little thumbs up that you can click on the bottom of that to sort of signify, oh, pay attention to this one. Uh, we'll do our best to get to all of them, um, but sometimes we, we meander about. Um, but uh, uh, Patricia Coleman had uh, a question that is kind of what we have been dealing with, I think, but see if anybody wants to add anything else. Uh, Patricia asked, she said, can someone give some tangible examples of what reciprocity with nature looks like on the ground for them? Does anybody, um, I mean, I think we've, we've touched on some of that. Any, anything else that, that anybody would add? I think there are thousands of ways, um, but I'm feeling uh, wonderfully um, humbled by what Anna and Peter said about listening and about um, really doing our inner work in order so to move forward into the world in a way that truly is healing as opposed to having our ideas and just going out and doing it. But one of the ways that I think about on the ground, of course, is restoration. Um, and I think about the ways in which restoration has and hasn't worked. Um, and so there seems to be a real need for us to, as Peter said, and as you said, Tom, to pay attention and to listen to what really is an appropriate restoration? What really is being responsive to a system that we can never fully define? So that's the first thing that comes to mind. I mean, I, I, I very much agree with Anna that doing our inner work is really important. Um, and not just as a place to start, but just in an ongoing way, simply developing mindfulness and getting our egos out of the way seems to be um, primary. And um, I also have to say, Anna, I loved you saying, just stop the harming. <laughs> and we can do that in a thousand ways. For me, uh, I, I think about how each individual choice and, and action, you know, be it something that I, I want to buy or not buy, or, you know, how, how am I um, complicit in the, the systems that we're all uh, wrapped up in and ensnared by that are creating harm in, in a thousand ways. And how can I be working toward intensely localizing systems? You know, for example, like how can I be supporting um, local regenerative agriculture? How can I be growing my own food? How can I verse myself in what plants are healing and grow them and then share that with other people? And how can I be doing as much as I can to, to minimize waste and live as simply as I can and, uh, and share the joy of that with my children. Uh, that for me, and, and part of that is, you know, we, we have permaculture programs that happen in the garden and the, many of the programs that I uh, do with patients, it's all about how do we take personal responsibility and see ourselves as a, as a force of good to the extent that we can, or at least non-harm doing to the extent that we can.
Um, I wanted to mention, as far as this idea of sort of tangible examples, um, uh, and by the way, uh, Carol, you asked a question about saying you can't seem to see the questions or the comments. You should, if you click on the on the little voice box Q&A at the bottom, that should open up a box that shows you them. Um, uh, I wanted to mention one of the articles in the special issue um, that's by uh, Gary Nabhan, Laura Orlando, Laura Monti, and um, James Aronson um, really deals with this very explicitly. Um, uh, so those of you who have the journal, it's called Hands-On Ecological Restoration as a Nature-Based Health Intervention, Reciprocal Restoration for People and Ecosystems. Um, Laura was going to be on here. I'm not sure if she is. Um, the... Uh, one thing I was just going to add is, is for me and my work and, and a lot of my background is as a conservation biologist. Um, some of the some of the reciprocal action actually is political uh, in some ways. Um, so and the, the example that popped in my head just because I've been involved in it in the last 24 hours is um, a, a wonderful place in the upper Amazon basin in Ecuador where I have taken many groups has been under a lot of threat right now because of the dual factors of the COVID, um, uh, COVID restrictions, which are, are, are keeping p tourists away who have, who have the, the income they've brought has allowed, um, allowed the indigenous community there to, to, to uh, conserve the forest in a way they didn't, we weren't doing for a while but also a, a horrible oil spill in, in the river in that area. And so a group of us have been trying to brainstorm ways to, to sort of support that indigenous community so that they can continue to support that force. So that, that's just a, a, an example that's recent in my mind, but that, that's a place that I have gone on multiple occasions and every time it has like blown my mind with the beauty of the world. Um, and so here's an opportunity to give something back. So I think there's a lot of different ways that this can go. And, and in my mind, it doesn't, the reciprocity isn't necessarily in the moment, but it can be sort of separated out in time a little bit. Um, so uh, it's certainly, it's all about gratitude. So uh, anybody else want to say anything about that before we move on to another question? Um, I just, I, I think it's just really an important question. And I don't, I think part of our work here is to keep it as one of the central questions and on uh, all and recognize we're, we're just touching the, you know, outsides, outsides of it. Uh, you know, I think Anna and in, in her has such an integrated life that's so admirable and it's, you know, professional in the medicine and then on the garden. And I mean, it's, it's really remarkable. And that lets her move in certain ways that not everybody can. And so then, you know, I'm in an academic environment and uh, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, and, 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 you know, so then I get into it in terms of nature and health and I, and I'll, part of my work is trying to expand that view in the way that I've spoken about today. And in some ways, it's not that deep. Uh, I don't feel like I'm living. I don't feel like I personally live immersed in the in the depth of this question. I'm often trying to move people who are really resource oriented, but with great intentions and doing great work. So I'm not, you know, on one hand, I don't want it to mean anything here. Um, but uh, I think it only goes a certain <laughs> A, cer a certain distance, the sort if, without asking the reciprocity question that's at the, at the heart of our round table today, you end up with questions such as, um, what's the optimal dose of nature for <laughs> human beings? And that, and I'm not kidding, that becomes a central driving force of major research programs. And then you end up with uh, developers asking, well, how many trees do I have to plant in this space in order to get a 10% improvement in mental health? It's in that world, these are entirely reasonable, exciting, the, the, the leading questions that need to be answered. And so I think what, I think what you're, you know, we're putting forward and trying to wrestle with for many of us, it's part of a worldview that is of that world. And we're trying to somehow pivot and, and ask 
you know, different questions. And it's, you know, somebody was asking about environmental issue, uh, justice issues and the race issues. Of course, that's front and center for many of us today. And for many of us, we're being asked to pivot <laughs> and we pivot and we try and, we, and then we open. And it's not saying that we have the answer, but it means we know that the pivot needs to happen. And in some ways, this, what you have been bringing forward with reciprocity, that's, for me, that's the pivot. That's great. Thank you. And, and a couple other examples. Um, can my, I, 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 was, I was mentioning um, Gary et al's article um, a minute ago, another uh, beautiful article in the special issue that also deals with some very explicit uh, behaviors of reciprocity is one by Edie Dillon, who is on the call here uh, as well. And, and it, it's kind of woven through many of the articles. So I think many of the authors address this question as well. Also, I just noticed Usha Faranasi, a uh, contributor to the issue, just, just um, put a note, uh, the, the relationship of the gardener to her garden, opening it up to birds and wildlife and all critters and be heal, being healed by the garden is reciprocal healing at a very personal level. So um, yeah, thank you for that, Usha. Um, so um, let's see, I'm just gonna kind of move down through some of the questions. I, I was trying to get the ones that were directly related to what we were just talking about. Um, Carol uh, Harden, um, I'll just read it in case, in case any of you are not seeing the questions or comments. She says, this is probably just a semantic thing. I think, as nat I think of nature as a beautiful and essential resource for us to connect to ourselves. And as you said, within the reality that we are part of this resource, not in the extract uh, or extractive, I guess, in dominant way, but to remember our status as a deep part of this ecosystem and to be awake and aware as we interact with ourselves and the, quote, external world, unquote. Um, thank you for that, Carol. Anybody have any any comment or response to that? I, I see a lot of nodding <laughs> on the panel. I think we agree. <laughs> um, the uh, um, uh, Oren has a question for you, Laura, specifically. Um, whoops, I just lost it. There it goes. It says, Laura, what do you mean by spirit? You mentioned that we are part of Earth. Are we a spiritual being as well as a, a physical being? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> So um, by spirit, I mean that part of us that aspires to um, connection with something larger than ourselves. I think of it uh, like I think of the transpersonal self who wants that deepened connection with a larger sphere. Um, and that larger sphere can take a lot of different forms, uh, the way I think about it. But without that hunger or that, that drive for connection, um, I do think we'd be spiritless. We'd be without our spirits. Our spirits are so much about the desire to connect. And I don't mean between humans and humans. I mean in that transpersonal uh, sense. But yes, I, I think that uh, for a strong eco-psychology, it's really important. And for a healthy world all the way around, I think it's important that we recognize the value of our spiritual selves, the importance of it. That's uh, Oren's question um, is interesting. Um, Earlier, just about a little over a month ago, we had a program, an online program here where that was a conversation between myself and Drew Lanham, a wonderful um, ornithologist. Um, and we were talking about the practice of natural history, among other things, being a spiritual practice. And um, that led to a really interesting discussion afterwards uh, between myself and uh, Carol, a different Carol, who I think might be on the call here, but um, uh, where we were going back and forth, like, of course, uh, that term spirit, spirit, spirituality, spiritual, those are all kind of slippery terms that can be misinterpreted. But I, but I, I think um, 
what you said, Laura, about as a, as a, a practice that, that connects us with forces larger than ourselves is kind of what I meant too. And as I already said, I think natural history, the practice of attentiveness to the world does that inherently. And in fact, is, is uh, I would say historically was the basis of, of every religious and spiritual tradition in the world initially. Um, so anybody else have anything they want to say about that? But spirit. <laughs> I mean, for me, one of the one of the reciprocal uh, acts is to to be in a place where um, we are more and more attuned to that mystery and the ineff ineffable and that which is greater than ourselves. And so many people have had experiences um, of of being blown wide open by going and sitting out in nature for maybe you know maybe fasting maybe having a, a period of time where where you're out and in that connection with how small our self is and how great it all is and that is i mean that's a direct connection for me with spirit and also with listening and with guidance and with reciprocity and being in um you know on a on a moment to moment basis, um, just so grateful and awestruck by it all. And uh, and for us humans to occasionally dip into that um, that place of, of wonder and connection with that which is greater than ourselves uh, and spend some time there in, in humility, grace and deep listening. Like that's another beautiful example, I think of, of reciprocity that, that quiets uh, and connects to what it is to be human on a living, breathing planet. I mean, in some ways, this this issue, this question, has run through the field of eco psychology with different <laughs> eco psychologists taking different positions, saying you you um, you don't need that much of a commitment to spirit to be a top eco psychologist to be doing eco. <laughs> And you, the, the idea that without it, you don't have eco-psychology. So I don't think on eco-psychology side, there's a single answer. Um, I, I think it's a, a definitely worth, all, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the big ones uh, in terms of topics and, in, and of importance. Um, spirit is one of those words that can get used in a lot of different ways in meaningful ways by different people. E.O. Wilson in Biophilia, he often uses the word the human spirit. He writes so beautifully, so passionately, and he means it in a reductionistic way. He's a sociobiologist, he's evolutionary. I mean, he, so often he's using it and he, you know, it's, he, it's, yeah. So that's one way to understand spirit as still as because he's an empiricist he's an empiricist who's using the word human spirit in a really deep and obviously he feels so much for nature and that's so that's one space i think the way uh some of you are using it here it's 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 more than that and the question is what what more and this is one of those very hard issues because often you know on a spirit level well, in the Tao Te Ching, where it says, you know, the, the Tao that can be spoken of isn't the true Tao. I mean, and if you put in spirit for Tao, anything about spirit that you try to put words to, that's formalizing it. It's a formalizable construct. And at that point, you have a formalization. And for many, something that can be, that, that's formalizable in that way, that can be articulated and with language, that isn't spirit. And so by the very attempt to name it, you've lost it. And that doesn't work for the empiricist. <laughs> so uh, that makes talking about this very difficult. And I just want to put that out there because at the same time, what Laura and Anna are highlighting is that for many of us, it's at the very core of life, life with a small L and life with a big L, life, life. And to have these discussions without that embedded in it is, uh, to, miss, is to miss it all, is to miss it. But often you can't have these discussions if you try to put this in because you, you just lose the person. It, it's, it's just too, it's not where they are. And at that point, um, 
that's fine. You, you know, that's okay. You don't need, you don't need that. And so in this discussion, it's notice we didn't start with this. <laughs> We're ending <laughs> more in this because there's a certain level of trust now, right? There's a trust, there's a depth, there's an intimacy. And all of a sudden we can, can move to a new space with each other. And uh, I think what we've just done in this hour is, is the same thing we do in relationships with other people, but potentially uh, this is my last point here is potentially this is another pivot on a worldwide level that needs to happen. Great. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, we got a lot of great questions coming in and we're, we're running a little bit short of time. So I'm gonna, I'll try to keep us moving along. Um, I, I'm going to read um, Usha uh, again, because I'm not sure if everybody can see all the questions. Um, Usha had another a comment here that, that ties into some of this to, that reflects on some of what we said. And then, then we have a, specific question, I think, for you, Anna, actually. Um, so Usha says, I believe if we want to move from words to action for reciprocal healing, we need to be more aware and attentive about our every thought and action as we interact with nature. It may sound counterintuitive that we should be alert and not spontaneous, but in all three Eastern religions, Hindu, Jain, or Buddhist, we are taught that in order to break our mechanical behavior of just taking, we must be aware, as Laura says, of giving and the pleasure of giving. Once we savor this feeling and we are aware, we slowly become spontaneous. So if we want our words and hope to be realized, we must be aware and attentive and then become spontaneous. Reciprocity becomes our innate self. So nice. thank you yep. for that, Usha. Um, we have a, uh, a question, whoops, I just, okay, from Stephanie. Um, and I, I think this is really you, uh, for you, uh, Anna. Uh, she says, as a pre-med student, formerly an environmental science and plants major with interest in pursuing integrative medicine, what clinics in the Bay Area practice integrative medicine that you might know of? I found it difficult to find. Is there an mm. easy, short answer to that? Or is this a follow-up <laughs> conversation, perhaps? <laughs> I, I would welcome a follow-up conversation. There are many. Um, you know, I, uh, so I work in Marin and West Marin and, and do integrative medicine, as do many of my colleagues within the, the Federally Qualified Health Center system. Uh, there, so yeah, I, I, I would welcome actually uh, I would you know, feel free to to be in touch with me. Um, let's see here. What would be the best way to do that? Um, but there there are there are many. Um, but I work at Coastal Health Alliance, our our uh, sister organization, the Petaluma Health Center, has many um, integrative medicine practitioners. There are many over in the East Bay. There's some phenomenal things happening over there. I mean, I have a, a real strong um, justice or orientation. And so I'm most um, connected and affiliated with those people who are within the safety net system, as opposed to um, more of the uh, concierge style practices. But there are many amazing concierge style practices too, many of whom are, are friends of mine. So um, please, let's, let's be in touch. Great. Thank you. Um, See, one question has been up for a while from Richard. Uh, he asks, how does our racial justice imperative raise considerations for, quote, reciprocity to and for whom? <clears throat> Excuse me. How can healing be stimulated and supported where needs are greatest? Anybody have a response to that? I'd love to just jump in. I mean, there's so many different layers of this that, that could be articulated and uh, worked toward. Uh, what's coming up for me right now as a, as a land steward, as a person who, um, by virtue of so many layers of privilege, you know, being a white person who is um, had the privilege of a solid family structure and enough um, affluence to send me to college and uh, and then to be able to travel in the world unfettered. I am uh, I am the recipient of of great privilege and um, therefore have this great responsibility to um, to share what I have and to to lift up those people who who have not been as fortunate and to work also toward the dismantling of, of systemic uh, oppression. And so in apropos our conversation right now, like I, I feel that uh, those of us who are stewarding land or have, have the capacity to 
partner with and make available or, or eliminate whatever barriers we can in order to um, make like access not an issue is one. Um, and that's hard, you know, as a, as a director of a nonprofit um, in a rural location uh, with a, a deep dedication and belief in cultivation of relationship and, uh, and you know, looking at dismantling barriers and, and uh, working toward uh, it, this, um, this level of healing, there are, there's so, so much work to do. Um, so it's way beyond intention and, and then toward like some practical things around um, fundraising and um, who you're partnering with and how and, and sensitivity, like what is it, who is, who feels safe in nature and how, you know, so, so for me, it's like, it's partnering with and reaching out and creating relationship with those people who, uh, who are leading and listening again, like any sort of relationship being in the listening for, for what's needed. How can I respond? How can I be of support? Where do I step back? Um, and, and how do we uh, work in the collective for um, having access to nature be an absolutely uh, guaranteed protected human right. So be it in the urban environment toward uh, restoration and greening of environments and spaces or working toward um, figuring out how to make transportation um, and navigating roads in rural spaces is really trigg triggering and scary for people of color. You know, it turns out even if they want to be in your program and they have a deep affectionate relationship with you. Um, it, it's not a time right now where a lot of people even feel safe driving in rural areas. Um, so it's a huge question. It's so important and there's so much work to be done. And um, and I'm grateful that it was raised and, and it just takes a lot of leaning in and keeping it on our radar and uh, forming forming relationships and partnerships and uh, digging in even when it's hard or financially risky or you know whatever whatever the case because um, you know all of us here on this screen uh, by virtue of the color of our skin have tremendous privilege so uh, yeah it's just it's that's of the utmost important in this in this moment. Thank you, Anna. Anybody else have anything or? At, at that i think she covered it i say yes to what yes. she said <laughs> um, and and i would also add that that as i'm sure is true for for many of us uh in in the professional networks that i'm involved with for example i've been very involved in the ecological society of america um and ev every group that i know is focusing on this very intently and of course there's no easy answers or but, but um, as I think really one of the important things that, that Anna said is that we just have to keep it on the radar and not just let it be a fad that passes by this summer kind of thing. I mean, I think what's remarkable is that this is all happening in this political climate over the last four years. So it's one of those, I can't even get my mind wrap my, my head around it that there's been a lot of progress this last, these last four years. You know, the Me Too movement came of came about during this time and, and now the Black Lives Movement and how that happened. I mean, you know, and, and this is where, you know, I mean, uh, the issue of, it's it's very hard to read these times and the issues of, of, of being hopeful. Um, sometimes I think all of us wake up and it's like, I can't believe, you know, there's there's a lot of despair and anger and, uh, and this racial question just is a, just a piece of that. And I would, and I often feel that, but I also recognize that sometimes it takes something very large to uh, um, transform. To you know, and this happens obviously on a personal level. Anna, you must see this so often with with illness, and Ill, large illness has a capacity to transform people. It doesn't always, of course. Well, we're in that position right now with large worldwide upheavals and it has a capacity if we and so this is an opportunity and i think part of you know what all of us you know not just us i mean every everyone who's a participant here i know i mean i recognize a lot of the names and people are doing amazing work and that is the that is part of the work that that's the transformation and that's happening in the midst of a political climate that is outrageously difficult 
Thanks, Peter. So just a um, sort of um, a facilitator comment here is, is uh, what we've been on for over an hour. And I think, I think in, in respect of everybody's time, we're going to want to wrap up fairly soon. I'd, I'd say about roughly 10 minutes or so. So we have a few questions that have been that have been on screen for a while that I'd like us to try to deal with, but maybe as succinctly as we can, um, and then we'll kind of wrap up. Um, and and then I'll I'll say again, reiterate at the end, like where you can find this discussion later, and so on and so forth. So um, Taya, if I'm saying your name right, uh, so asks, does the development of a of an ecological self require a mental spiritual move that necessarily goes beyond enlightened self-interest guiding our interactions with nature? If so, would you consider this an egoic destruction or an egoic expansion or both? <laughs> That's a fun question. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's see. Peter, do you want to take a, a stab at that one? No, Thea uh, is a doctoral student, uh, fifth year doctoral student at the University of Washington in my lab. We, we have many <laughs> questions. I would love to hear somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, let's see. Ecola requires mental spiritual move. I would say, yes, it requires a mental spiritual move, certainly a worldview shift. Um, I, I think most fundamental, it's, it's a move from seeing oneself as that independent or that individual being that is defined by uh, me, by my experience, my history, my belief, my need, my emotional state, to uh, an awareness of self as being participant, and deeply so, and deeply influenced by the information and energy that's pouring in all the time through our senses, for starters. Um, and that seems to me that it's a, a, a mental shift. It's also born of experience. It's an experiential event, I think, to find yourself in that state before you, you uh, even think about it. I, I, it. That brings to mind um, a student of mine that came back from tracking one day and he'd been out tracking for hours and he was just completely lit up and he, he said I've I, 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 I was the animal I was the track I it, he was so beyond he said I completely forgot about myself completely and it was entirely experiential in that moment so I would say um it's that, and certainly the spiritual component, um, uh, in my view, stems from that identification that is beyond oneself, that is, is to something larger and, uh, and basically unknown. Um, so it's a kind of surrendering as well. Let's see what else is here. Um, goes beyond enlightened self-interest. Well, I think I, I've begun to think that the ecological self has lots of dimensions, just like any other sense of self. And that the, the concept of the enlightened self interest is a part of the ecological self. And it's something that can be experienced when we're operating from that enlarged identification. Um, I don't know if that really answers the question there, but um, would you consider this an egoic destruction or an egoic expansion or both? Um, well, yes. <laughs> I would consider it an egoic destruction if we're talking about ego in the typical sense of the word or the way that we often use it in our common parlance, which is, very much about the egoic needs. It's about the part of us that that needs or wants something. And um, 
to be identified with a, a larger sense of it, in that larger sense um, cannot be driven by need. It's driven by this desire for uh, connectivity and, and presence with this. All I can say is enlarged awareness. Um, so yes, I would say there is an egoic destruction that takes place and it's a good thing. <laughs> I, that was just, you know. <laughs> um, as we, so as we move towards closure here, that there's two, quest, two, two questions that have been up for a bit that I want to get to. And then I, but I also want to point out, um, Rachel at, uh, put a note on here that I would encourage you to check out of, about an article that she has written um, that connects with some of the topics that we're talking about. Um, so um, one um, very specific question from Julie. Um, she says she's trying to learn more about transparency in investing and how people can educate themselves to orient their investing towards nature accompaniment and reciprocity and ask if any of us have resources or insights to share on this topic. Um, and uh, I, I would just say, that um, there's, there's, I've learned that there's a, a lot of good financial advisors out in the world who this is kind of what they do and have been trying to figure out how to do. And sometimes it goes under the name of socially responsible uh, investing. Sometimes uh, there's another term which I'm blanking out on at the moment, but um, I think it's probably beyond the scope of what we can address here right now, unless anybody has a quick answer. But, but I, I would look into um, just, I mean, the financial advisors and people who really do that, there are some of them that this is really what they're trying to do. And I've, I've found some good people. So um, anybody else have anything to add about that? Okay, but it, uh, but it, it absolutely agreed with Julie that that's incredibly important and and a and a, a type of um, a form of of, of 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 action on behalf of reciprocity that we all have the power or many of us have the power to do. So maybe the final question here uh, is uh, is sort of uh, two related questions from Rich. Uh, he said that he just saw the movie Living in the Time of Dying, which affected him deep, deeply and wondering if any of us have seen it and what our thoughts were, but, and then kind of connected to that thoughts on their conclusions of quote, courageously believing the science unquote, that even if we were to stop all the environmental destruction, pollution, exploitation on a dime tomorrow, the science says there's already so much momentum and self amplifying carbon releasing climate warming factors that things are going to get much worse. Immense sufferings ahead. Billions will die. Most coastal cities will be lost and humans are likely headed for extinction along with many thousands of species da, 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 da. how to be with this and continue with the with the work we're discussing with authentic hope question mark so that's a big huge <laughs> important question um i might start i mean as far as the movie my answer is no i, I do not know i'm not familiar with the film but i certainly am familiar with that that conundrum that that you that rich presents um in my uh, in my uh, world, a lot of that was as a as a practice as a as a teacher and practitioner of conservation biology, which, as a field, is is basically about you know stemming the tide of extinctions and and addressing all that. And so, I think what which brings up is is incredibly important um, to um, uh, that that there is a, a balance somehow to be to be sought between. Um, acknowledging and really feeling, or as, what's the term, courageously uh, believing how bad things might get or can get, or some would say will get, um, at the same time as trying to um, kind of still connect with the, with the joy and, 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 as I would put it, the gift of being alive in this incredibly beautiful world. And um, I found, you know, I, I taught uh, taught conservation biology at a small liberal arts college for 30 years, and I found that that in the as the years went by, that 
basically Rich's question was what became foremost in that work was, was trying to provide um, authentic sources of hope that were not BS because people know that. And, and, you know, to be honest, it became harder and yet um, as the years went by, but the, but I think, I think that is the balance. And, and I, I, I mean, one thing, and I might sound a bit like a broken record here, but one of the things I used to tell students a lot is that natural history was their ally. Um, that, that, the, that, that learning that, that nature is not just a bunch of, you know, quote unquote systems and, and numbers and so on, but it is what you bear witness to when you go out and you look through binoculars or a hand lens or lock your back door and that that is real too. And that the more we, we develop and the, the, this practice of attentiveness, yes, it, 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 it forces us to stare destruction in the eye in many cases, but it also engenders the capacity for, for realizing there's, there's more and greater beauty than oftentimes we ever had any glimpse of before. So that's what I would offer. Anybody else? I, I spend a lot of time thinking about this and what it means to be resilient and what it means to be courageous in these times and um, how we can, despite the, the odds, uh, align ourselves again and again, you know, over and over again with uh, truth telling and love of the natural world and all of the beings therein and have the integrity of, of thought and action in mind to realign, aligning ourselves with that which uh, will serve life, even knowing that we could all go extinct and, and working the non-attachment edge as much as, as possible while fiercely um, believing that, that healing happens and that there are um, Yes, there are feed forward loops and there are forces that are set, that have been set in motion. And uh, there are so many different moving pieces in all of the models, some of, many of which are our own human behaviors and that we are moving toward this razor's edge of um, self-reflective awareness or not. And we don't know which way it's gonna go. And we have a front row seat on one of the, the more compelling dramas that's ever unfolded. Um, and so I, I try to um, hold it with fascination and love and heart and, and great belief that even if we all go extinct, that all like every good action is inherently worth doing. Yeah, that's great. So, go ahead, Peter. Um, you know, another way to maybe frame it goes back on it to when you were talking about mystery. And there's a lot, you know, there's a lot we don't know. Of course, you put the scientist hat on and you understand there's a lot we don't know, but there's a deeper sense of what we don't know. And so sometimes I just try to remember that. Um, people who have um, pursued the spirit side have said, we don't understand what's going on uh, and that we are too caught up in, you know, it's kind of like everything's happening, happening on the circumference of a globe and we're missing the entire center of everything because we think everything on the outside is everything and it's not, it's the outside. And people who have experienced that um, say that that center, you know, some of the language that Anna has brought forward this evening in terms of um, at, 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 the, at the core love as being so deep and interpenetrating and such joy is there and we don't see it. And it's very, very hard to I mean, the environment that we're in is so difficult and the news feed that has gotten more and more difficult and in, almost invasive in the mind uh, and addictive in some way, it's very hard to not pay attention and keep paying attention to it. It shapes our thought processes and uh, part of paying attention is paying attention to what that's doing to us so that uh, we 
stay aware of that outside of the circumference. But can we find more and more of our life on the inside? Um, and I would go back to some of the language I was trying to use earlier, that that inside does not necessarily have language tied to it. <laughs> Uh, it's not a formalizable system. And so, um, you know, so that obviously this is a big discussion or it would be no discussion. We would, we, we would be sitting with each other. Uh, but there's tremendous, there, you know, Joanna Macy talking of active hope. And I think part of our discussion has been around active hope, but I think there's another type of hope that is, a, that is experientially lived, you know, you know about that center and all of you do in some way, all of us do in some way. We know about that center. Usha was referring to that as well in her, in her, in her comments. And that center is what's grounding us. And that's what lets us move forward as well in the face of what Rich's comment was about what our mind is telling us about the future. So, Thank you so much. I'm sorry, go ahead, Laura. I, I just want to say um, that I, I draw my comfort um, along the lines of what Anna said. Um, I see this as a time where the selection pressures are on uh, humans. Um, it's like just, you know, like the, the pressure is very extreme for us to adapt in a way that um, demands our, the evolution of our consciousness. There is so much pressure for us to show up in a self-reflexive, with self-reflexive awareness and be the best humans we can in the context of something larger than ourselves. And the thought that we or some of us or some band might actually make that shift, that, that um, step change perhaps in our view of the world and the way we uh, um, behave towards all others in a, a, a really fundamental consciousness shift is what gives me hope. And um, I have faith in, in the human mind that we can do at least some of this work and the practice of it in each day is part of what sustains my joy. Um, it makes me feel like I am engaged with a much bigger world than myself. Um, so that's part of how I, hunt for hope. That's great, thanks. I would just, I would just say, watch birds. <laughs> <laughs> they're around, they live everywhere humans live in the world and they're miraculous. And, um, they're singing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think we could obviously, uh, all of us, including everybody on the, on the, in the session, could, could go on and on about all these things for a long time and it would be fun to do so, but I think we need to wrap up. We've been going for an hour and a half now and um, in respect of everybody's time, I, I think we'll, we'll, we'll bring things to a close here. So I want to first and foremost, thank my wonderful colleagues, um, Laura, Anna and Peter, thank you so much for being with us tonight and being so present and, and um, offering so much. Um, thank you to everyone who's made the time uh, all over the world, actually, to join us here to, to, tonight or this morning, as the case may be. And um, it's really wonderful. I want, want to reiterate again um, that on behalf of the Natural History Institute, we hope you'll feel part of our community and, and um, continue to um, use us as a, as a community, as a network to connect with a lot of wonderful people. And again, to mention our, our website is naturalhistoryinstitute.org and our YouTube, there's a, a Natural History Institute YouTube channel, which you can subscribe to. And um, within 24 hours, this session will be archived. It takes, it takes a, a number of hours for the, the recording to kind of spool through and for us to sort of trim off the, the opening session part while we were just waiting, but it should be there by this time tomorrow for sure and feel free to direct other people there. And as I mentioned earlier, also 
uh, there's a lot of related material actually already up there because there, there's a section on our on that YouTube channel of videos from the reciprocal healing confluence last November, including some interviews, some some of the so presentations, and so on. And there's also a page on our website that directs you to all of that as well. So that said, uh, you know, much gratitude to everybody involved here uh, for this session. And of course, much gratitude to the world that inspires us to keep connecting like this. And with that, you know, good night and good Thanks, morning. Um, <laughs> thanks so much. All right. So good to 